This morning we are actually continuing or coming back to the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 9, and we're going to be looking at verses 43 through 48, which um, providentially address one of the reasons, one of the excuses people use why they will not come to Jesus Christ, why they, why they won't pick up the Bible and read it, why they won't come to church and worship the Lord, and it's simply because they don't believe these things to be true. And even those who do seem to believe some of the things the Bible says seem to be most reluctant to believe this particular doctrine, the doctrine of hell, for a variety of reasons. But those of you, of course, who are Christians and who know that the Bible is the Word of God should be firmly convinced just by my reading this text this morning. Because your Lord, Jesus Christ, tells you that hell exists. Let's look at this in Mark 9, verses 43 through 48. Jesus says, and if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than having your two hands to go into hell, into the unquenchable fire, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than having your two feet to be cast into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to stumble, cast it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of heaven with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now again, this morning we're dealing with one of the, uh, another reason why some people will not receive the gospel. Perhaps this is a reason why you have not received it. And that is because you do not believe in the doctrine of hell. You do not believe that there's really that danger ahead that we've just read about that, that Jesus Christ was warning his disciples about. Perhaps you think everyone goes to heaven. Or perhaps as others that mm, those who don't go to heaven perhaps just disappear into nothingness. That there is no hell. That basically there cannot be a hell. That no one suffers, especially not forever. Because the God that you think about, the God that you believe exists, simply could not do that to anyone. Well, Jesus in our passage brings us face to face with the fact that God, or the, well, that God has created a hell, the hell does exist. And since Jesus does, of course, we need to deal with it. Now, certainly after listening to him, if you still conclude that it doesn't exist, then you can certainly go back to, to living the way that you were living before without any of the concerns that hell might generate. But you need to realize that you may very well learn about it the hard way. But if you choose to listen to him and conclude it's real, then you need to realize as well as we've already seen in the uh, parable of the rich man and Lazarus that there's something that you need to do to avoid it something that would be far better for you to do, which is to repent and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ than to spend an eternity in hell, in the unquenchable fire from which there is no escape. This morning what I'd like for us to do is consider three things. The first thing is that hell does exist and why we believe it does. Secondly, why you should be afraid of hell. And then thirdly, how you can escape it. First of all, I want you can, to consider that hell really does exist. Now, how can I say that that is true? And how can you actually believe that's true, especially in the modern world? I mean, after all, isn't it true that science uh, years ago put out the fires of hell? Uh, prove that God doesn't exist. Uh, prove that the Bible, therefore, cannot be his word if he doesn't exist, and that, therefore, the things in the, uh, the Bible can't be true. That everything really just happened as a grand cosmic accident. 
at some point in time, if there was such a thing as time, uh, the explosion took place, all this matter just was flung out to the far reaches of the universe and has organized itself purely by time and chance into everything that you see and hear today. Now science may have convinced some that this is in fact the case, but certainly hasn't convinced everyone. I'm certainly not convinced that's the case. There are some who are not willing to accept their conclusions, who would argue that time and chance really don't explain anything, that God is the only reasonable explanation for the things that we see, and that his word is in fact true. Let me begin by giving you two arguments for the fact that hell does exist. The first one we might say from reason, from those things that, that God has actually put in his creation that show that he exists, as well as things that he has given to us that prove that hell exists. And then the second argument being that from revelation or from the word of God. Well, the first argument is simply this, that the design that we see and the things that God has made certainly proves that a designer exists and the only designer that could actually you know, be sufficient for what we see must be God. I think the greatest proof that God has given to us of his existence is actually ourselves. When you consider what it is that you are and what it is you're capable of doing. I mean, uh, again, science believes that all these things took place by chance, that somehow a, a cell spontaneously generated out of the blue and has continued to progress through accidental mutations and uh, giving them some kind of advantage and continually gaining more and more information as it works its way up. I've heard some even more ludicrous uh, examples of what might have taken place that perhaps our organs all developed independently and they are all living independently and then one day decided to crawl together and begin to work together, you know, so that your brain existed somewhere, you know, else and was living on its own somehow and crawled into a skull and decided to add a few eyes and so forth and eventually compose itself into a body. It's ridiculous. But as we talk about organs, I mean, consider what it is that the Lord has given to you and what these things do. I mean, after, uh, for instance, the um, digestive tract, the mouth and the throat, the stomach and the intestines to eat and digest the food that happens to be in the world for you to eat. Isn't that interesting? God, I mean, you, you have a mouth that's able to, uh, you know, and a system that's able to make use of these things, but there are things there too that you can make use of. You have lungs that are able to take in oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide Interestingly enough, there is also oxygen for you to breathe. And that oxygen isn't depleted because there is also the means to produce more oxygen in this world when this oxygen, as this oxygen is being used up. The Lord has given to you a heart and arteries and veins to, to pump blood through your system to bring that food and that oxygen to the many cells of your body, to every single one of them that's living, and to carry away the waste products. Isn't that interesting? and the kidneys to filter your blood so that you're not killed by the poisons that build up within your system. Muscles that allow you to actually move and do things that are useful. Bones to hang all these organs on so they don't just kind of lay out all over the place, you know. Uh, he's also given hinges to these bones so that you can move, you know, you can move around and do different things. You've got skin that protects all of these organs and bones and everything that's inside of you from bacteria and other dangerous things. And then you have senses, eyes to see and ears to hear, a nose that smells and tongue that tastes, nerves to feel, as well as all the different things that are out there to stimulate those senses so that you can gather information about the outside world. You have a brain that is able to coordinate all these senses and to keep all these organs functioning in time, as it were. Not to mention, of course, the fact that all these organs that you have, all these systems that do all these particular things, these have all grown out of a single cell. I mean, you used to be, and I used to be, just a single cell residing within our mothers. 
And of course, as the fertilization took place, the information was there, it was present to build all these systems that we've just talked about and to create you, I mean, the blueprint for you. And all that information resides in every single cell within your body, every single one of them on your DNA has that information, as well as the mechanism to put it into use and, as it were, the context in which that information is actually useful. I mean, information is only useful in particular contexts, just like you know, English words and Spanish words and German words only make sense in the context of that particular culture, and that particular language. So this information only makes sense in a particular context, which happens to exist and the mechanism to make use of it at the same time to build you and to build all these systems and to enable you to do all these things. So all these things are present and they are working together at the same time. Not only giving you the ability to live and to do the things that are necessary to take care of yourself, but you also have a soul that can think, that can desire, and that can make morally significant choices. You can also communicate with people who are like you. Now our bodies, our minds, and our souls, all these things are wonderful things that no amount of evolutionary theorizing can ever possibly explain. The fact that you're here is absolute proof of an intelligent creator who also lives and who thinks and who desires and who makes morally significant choices as we are going to see. Now if that weren't enough, again, consider all the other things that we see, the plant life, the animal life, the fact that we have a solar system, that we're on the one planet in the solar system that can sustain life. I mean, think about, again, the idea of how the world may have come about. Uh, some scientists believe that we all sort of spun off of a common uh, chunk of matter and so forth, and yet all the planets are so entirely different and you know, organized so differently as far as what they're made of and what their conditions are like, and yet here's this one planet that has everything necessary to sustain your life and my life. Consider the universe and the billions of galaxies that exist and the billions of stars that are in each one of them, and they are all working together. The more we study the universe, the more we realize it is actually working together as one designed, unified, whole system. Now, evolutionary theory cannot give adequate explanations for these things either, but only one who is intelligent and who is infinitely powerful can. Again, the evidence for God's existence is overwhelming. Now, how does that prove that hell exists from the fact that God exists? Well, it's because of one more thing that God has actually given to us that um, we all know that we have, but uh, people don't seem to connect too well with these days because they have beaten it so much into subjection that it hardly is able to do its work, but it still does. This God who made you has also given to you a conscience. And the conscience is that part of you that warns you not to do wrong things, that convicts you when you have done things that are wrong, when you've either done something you shouldn't have done or haven't done something that you should, when you hurt other people or when you offend God. Now it's also that part of you that can look at the wrongs that are committed by other people and desire that those things be justly punished. Now, God gave us a conscience. This God that made us gave us a conscience to restrain our sin. That evil that is in us, that desire to do wrong things so that we wouldn't like the way that we feel when we do things that are wrong so that we would not hurt other people any more than we already do. But there is one other thing that our conscience actually teaches us that is important for this particular argument. And that is that it warns us that there is judgment. That the wrong things that we have done deserve to be judged. That there is in fact a judgment coming. There's a reason why God makes us feel uncomfortable. Why he makes us feel guilty 
why he convicts us when we do something wrong. It's because there is judgment coming. A time when we will actually have to give an account to the one who has made us. Our conscience warns us that there is justice ahead for the crimes that we have committed. Punishment that is actually equal to our crimes. And what is the punishment that is equal to offenses against one who has the power and, again, who is infinite, but an infinite punishment, which is hell. Sometimes we look at the sins that we commit and we think they're relatively small things. And if they were offenses only committed against other people, that would be true. And they wouldn't necessarily deserve the kind of punishment that God tells us in his word that we deserve. But the fact that we commit these crimes against one who is infinitely holy and infinitely worthy is what makes them infinite crimes, worthy of infinite punishment. Hell is really what all of us deserve for our sins against this God who created us. Now again, this is the way, or at least the first way we know that hell exists, and that is the God who made us, and again, we know that we couldn't have just happened by accident. The God who made us gave us a conscience that warns us that there is judgment ahead. Not only to restrain our sins, but also that we might be aware that judgment is coming and would begin to look for a way out while there is still time. We're going to look at that way out in just a moment, but I want to go to the second argument, which is much easier, and that is we know that hell exists because the Bible says it exists. Now, we don't have time to go into arguments as to why we believe the Bible is the word of God. Certainly, if you're a Christian, you know it is the case because the Spirit of God has convinced you that it is the case. But even if you didn't have the Spirit of God to convince you, the fact that this Bible, this book, uh, reveals the God that we know exists in creation and that it is, in fact, a revelation of his holy will is enough for us to pay attention to it. Jesus, the Bible says, is the Son of God who became a man to save his people, tells us that hell exists in our passage this morning. Just in verse 43, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. For it is better for you to enter life crippled than having your two hands to go into hell, into the unquenchable fire. God gave us his word written by men that he directed by his Holy Spirit so that we might know that of this danger that was ahead and that we might also know the way to escape it while we still can because, as Jesus tells us, hell is a real place. Now, basically, that's the first point. Hell exists. We know it exists because God has told us in, his con in our consciences, but he's also told us in his word. Now, that brings us to the second point. Granted that hell is real, why should you be afraid of it? Well, Jesus gives us two very good reasons of why you and everybody else should be afraid of it. First of all, because it is a place of torment. It is a place that burns with fire. Now, I don't believe that he's speaking here necessarily of a literal fire, at least not at this point, because a literal fire cannot really hurt a soul. When the rich man died, he didn't take his body to hell with him. He was only there with his soul, and yet he was in agony. And yet there is a time coming that the Bible says when the Lord is going to raise the dead and reunite them with their souls, their bodies with their souls, and cast them into a fiery hell, the lake of fire, at which time the fire may very well be a literal fire. But whatever it is now, it certainly burns like fire. That's what Jesus tells us in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. That after the rich man died, he lifted up his eyes in hell. And being in torment, he saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue. For I am in agony in this flame. The first reason why you should be afraid of hell is because hell, the fire that burns in hell, is agonizingly painful. 
but you should fear it. Secondly, because Jesus says this fire never goes out. It's never quenched. It never runs out of fuel. It goes on forever and ever while those who are burning in it are never burned up but have to endure this agony everlastingly. In Revelation we read, Revelation 14, 11, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. Now again, Jesus' reference here to the worm that never dies, I think has to do with description that he's using of hell. You know, again, I, I mentioned earlier in the service how Jesus draws upon things that people are familiar with to teach them about things they're not familiar with. And here Jesus is actually just uh, using something that they are all familiar with in order to teach them about hell. And that was the valley, what's called the Valley of Hinnom or Gehenna, which is the word behind the word here that is translated hell. Uh, Gehenna, or this valley of Hinnom, is the trash dump that had a fire in it that was continually burning to burn up the trash that people would bring out, of course, to throw in it. But there was not only fire, there were also, as you know, maggots, if you've ever seen a trash heap. You know, there's maggots that are always in there as things decompose. Flies love to lay their eggs in there, the eggs hatch, the maggots begin to eat, and so forth. Jesus was using the valley of Hinnom as an illustration of hell, the fire that never goes out. Now, he's not saying that there are maggots in hell, but what he is saying that there is a place where the Lord throws his unrepentant enemies, basically the rubbish, it's the trash heap, that burns with unquenchable fire, and just as the trash is burned up in that fire, so the unrepentant wicked are burned up, as it were, in that fire, and yet really never consumed. Now think about this for a minute. Who could possibly endure an eternity of agonizing burning? I mean, we can't really conceive of, of what it's like. You know, think about, again, fire and how painful fire is. You ever burned yourself, something that's hot? You ever actually put your finger into a fire accidentally? I hope accidentally if you've done it, but have you ever burned yourself? You know how much that hurts? Consider your whole body burning in a fire. Can you imagine what, what the martyrs must have endured who were burned at the stake? I think that would be my least, least uh, you know, if I had a choice, that would be the last way that I'd want to go, probably next to being drawn and quartered. But it would hurt. It would, it would be unimaginable pain. But just imagine that pain, your whole body on fire for eternity. Can you imagine that? It's hard to imagine, again, the illustrations of eternity. I, I think I saw one recently that Thomas Watson, he says, imagine the entire world being one big ball of sand. And every thousand years, a bird comes by and picks up one of those grains of sand and flies away. And it comes back another thousand years, picks up another grain and flies away. And then consider the amount of time it would take for that whole world to be carried away by the bird. He says, that's just one moment in eternity. I mean, can you imagine how long it would take the bird to disassemble this planet grain by grain? And yet that's just a fleeting moment of eternity. This goes on forever. I can't imagine how painful that would be, how, how hopeless that would be. And yet that's exactly what Jesus says everyone who dies in their sins will have to face if they don't find a way to get rid of their guilt. So hell exists, and hell is a place of agonizing torment that goes on forever. So finally, the question we need to ask is this, how can you escape hell? We need to be thankful that there is a way. And if you're at all convinced that it's real, you'll certainly want to know how you can avoid it. The answer is simple, the gospel. And the gospel is the only way. I mean, this is the reason why God provided the gospel in the first place. The reason why God the Son came into this world as a man. The reason why he obeyed his Father's commandments. The reason why he went to the cross and bore the sins of his people. The reason why he died and was buried and rose again the third day and ascended up into heaven 
and sat down at the right hand of God. He did these things to bear the crimes of every single person who would put their trust in him. He did these things to save all who would turn from their sins, trust him as Savior, and bow to him as Lord, that they might escape hell and spend an eternity with him in heaven. Now, the Bible says that if you want to escape, you have to turn from your sins. You have to turn from those things that offend God. And that's really what Jesus has in mind here when he says it would be better to cut off your hand, to cut off your foot, to pluck out your eye, than to enter whole into hell. Jesus doesn't mean that it would be better for you literally to cut these things off or to pluck them out because it's not the hand that makes you stumble and fall into sin. It's not your foot and it's not your eye. Rather, it is your heart. It is your sin that is making you use your, your instruments, as it were, your hand, your foot, and your eyes to do the things that are offensive to God. It is your sinful desires that you have to give up. If you hold on to those things, the Bible says if you hold on even to one of them, then you will go whole into hell when you die. The Bible says you must be willing to give up every single one of your sins if you would enter into life. Now, of course, you must also trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior because repentance, which is what Jesus is referring to here, is simply the flip side of faith. As you turn from your sins, you must turn to the Savior. You must be turning to Jesus and trusting him to save you. When the jailer at Philippi, after the earthquake and the fact that he thought his prisoners escaped, as he was thinking about killing himself, drew his sword and was about to run himself through, and then as Paul tells him, don't, don't kill yourself, don't harm yourself because we're all still here, he asked them, what must I do to be saved? And what he meant by that was saved from judgment for his sins. How did the Philippian jailer know there was judgment for sins? Maybe he heard the gospel or maybe he was listening to the voice of conscience, but he did know that God was working with these men. And so he says, how can I be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You just need to trust what Jesus Christ has done to save sinners, to save you personally. It's not enough to believe. You must actually place your hope of heaven upon him. You have to turn away from any other hope at the same time, any other hope that you may have that in the end you're going to be good enough to enter into heaven. The Bible says you are not good enough. There is nobody who is good enough. He says in Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, not even one. And in verse 12, there is none who does good. There is not even one. You are not good enough. God will not accept you on your own. You have to come through Jesus Christ because he is the only one who is good enough. The gospel is basically this, that if you trust Jesus to save you, he will do it. He will save you. That's the only way you can come to God. That's the only way you can be saved from hell. You have to trust Jesus, turn from your sins, and you must follow him. So in closing, let me just simply remind you of this, that it's not enough to know that hell is real. It's not enough to be convinced that Jesus is the Savior, the only Savior from hell and the only way to heaven. It's not enough to believe that those things are true. You must actually trust him. You must turn from your sins. You must follow Jesus. You must live for Jesus if you are to escape hell and see heaven. By the way, when I say you must do these things, you do need to be reminded these are not things that you do in order to save yourself. These are not things you do in order to make yourself good enough to be accepted by God. Trusting Jesus is what you need to do 
in order to be accepted by God. These other things are only the evidences that you have trusted him because those who trust in the Lord, as we saw last Lord's Day, die with Jesus Christ and are raised again to life. Their lives are transformed. They no longer live for themselves and for their own pleasure, but they live now for Jesus Christ and for his pleasure. That is the definition of a Christian, one who lives for God's pleasure and does not seek his pleasure in the world, but rather seeks his pleasure in pleasing God. And that is where the true pleasure lies. And of course, only God's children know that that's the case. So don't let your sins drag you down into the unquenchable flames. Don't think as many Christians may think, and, and especially those of the world, that a God of love would never do this to one of his creatures. I've run into people like that. Maybe you have too. Oh, I believe in heaven because the Bible says it, but I, never, I could never believe that God could possibly ever send anyone to hell, even though the Bible tells us equally that hell exists and Jesus warns us. Get rid of your sins before they destroy you. A God of love, as a matter of fact, can send people to hell because God, who has an infinite love of what is right, loves justice. And he cannot endure that even the slightest sin would go unpunished. Now, the Bible says that God does not delight in the death of the wicked, and that's certainly true. But he does delight in the fact that those who die unrepentant of their sins are justly punished in hell for their sins. As a matter of fact, God is the fire that burns in hell. That is his wrath being poured out on sinners. Yes, a God of love can send people to hell for their sins. Those things must be satisfied for. Now, Jesus died on the cross to provide a satisfaction for sin, and the Father is perfectly willing to accept what his Son has done as full payment for your crimes if you will only trust him. But if you won't, then he will exact that judgment upon you because justice must be served. God loves what is right, and that is right. Only Jesus, though, can put out those flames. And he will do that for you if you will only put your trust in him. So trust in the Lord. If you have not trusted in Jesus, put your trust in him. If you think you're trusting in Jesus, then profess the fact that you are. Profess him openly, own him as your Lord and Savior, and live before the world as a Christian. That is really the only true Christian, the one who is willing to do that, who is willing to confess him before all men and do it so that others may also come to know him as Lord and Savior because they're going to die, they're going to perish, they're going to go to hell unless they hear about Jesus and repent of their sins. Somebody brought the gospel to you so that you can be saved. The Lord wants you to take that treasure and give it to someone else so that they can be saved as well. Let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to take his word and to apply it as we need to hear it 